Next on Unsolved Mysteries. A young man argues with his girlfriend and is then arrested in Mexico. Two hours later, he's dead. Was it suicide or murder? A ruthless doctor uses prescription drugs to knock out his victims and then rapes them. After a late night call, 21-year-old Elizabeth Campbell disappears. Is she the frightened young woman reported by several eyewitnesses? And a young woman believes that she may have been kidnapped by the couple who raised her. She is searching for her birth parents. These are stories you won't want to miss. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. Rosarita Beach, Mexico. 25 miles south of San Diego, California, it's known for its beautiful sunsets and romantic beaches. And that's why two Los Angeles couples headed there one weekend. But their vacation soon turned into a deadly nightmare. In less than 24 hours, one of them was arrested after a fight with his girlfriend. Two hours later, he was dead. The local authorities claimed that Mario Amato committed suicide. I say it was murder, plain murder. And I knew that from the beginning because I know my brother very well. They stole his life away from him. And uh, we're going to get to the bottom of this. Mario is not the first American tourist to die in a foreign jail. And his family is not the first to question the quote, unquote, official story. But few families have someone like Joe Amato fighting to reveal the truth. Mario and Joe Amato arrived in Rosarita Beach ready to party. Mario's girlfriend, who we'll call Paula, provided the condo. Joe and his girlfriend, Debbie, were just happy to be invited. The two couples quickly broke out the tequila. I says, well, what are we here for? To party. Let's have a good time. I guess it was later on about 3.30, 4 o'clock, and I was getting kind of tired and told Debbie, it's time to go to bed. About 7 o'clock, we woke up, and they were still up, and they were bickering. I want to leave now. I want to go home. She's driving me crazy. Please. Go to bed. Go to sleep, huh? I felt very disturbed because I know Mario liked this girl very much, and he wouldn't have wanted to leave if it wasn't something serious. I'm going to hit the bar, have a couple drinks. By late the next morning, Mario and Paula had apparently made up. That was the last time I saw him alive. Hey, Mario, leave the key underneath the mat. But I can still remember, like, expression on his face. He, he, he seemed very happy, like nothing was wrong. That afternoon, Joe and Debbie took a long drive along the coast, but back at the condo. I never want to see you I can't again. believe it. This, this is here. your idea of a fun time out here. What are you talking about? You're... I can't believe this. Hey, can I have some clothes, please? Yes, I want my clothes. Get out. Thank you. ¿Qué está pasando aquí, muchacho? ¿Cómo te llamas? My name is Mario Amado. Acabo de hacer una llamada que anda pasando problemas. No, 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 I don't, speak, I don't speak Spanish, officer. Well, somebody just told me they've been causing some problems in here. Mario was arrested for public drunkenness and disorderly conduct and was taken to the police station. He was placed in a holding cell, but was never formally charged with a crime. At around 6.30 p.m., Joe and Debbie returned to the beach house. They were surprised 
to find that no one was there and there was no key under the mat. A housekeeper explained that there had been trouble there a few hours earlier. Debbie crawled through a window to get inside. Almost immediately, four police officers from Tijuana showed up. They asked for Paula by name. What's wrong? What's going on? She's looking for Paula. She's not here. Do you know what she might be? Is there something wrong? No, no. We would just like to ask her a couple of questions. And that's when Debbie really started getting suspicious right about that time. A little later, Mario's girlfriend does come just waltzing in the house. And uh, <laughs> like nothing was wrong. And we asked her, where's Mario? And she said she didn't know. He's probably in some gutter somewhere. Oh, some gutter. Real cute. Real cute. Two hours after Paula returned, a group of detectives arrived looking for a relative of Mario's. Joe still had no idea that his brother had been arrested. Looking for the brother of Vicente Amador. Sorry, but we don't know Vicente. The first thing that went through my mind is they made a mistake. My brother's name Mario Vicente Amado. Yes, that's him. I have some bad news. Your brother is dead. I was hoping they had made a mistake, and I was just in disbelief that this could be happening. What happened to my brother? Perhaps it's better if you come with us. We should talk about it in my office. It's like a nightmare. Now, is this your brother? The first thing I see is Mario laying on the concrete. His eyes closed, no shirt, just his pants. Why isn't he wearing a sweater? That's how he killed himself. What? Because he tied it around his neck, and then he tied it around the crossbar and hung. Where was this crossbar? About three feet off the ground. Three feet? And I'm going, no, 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 no. You can't kill yourself with a sweater. So I asked him, was there anybody in the, in the jail to stop him from doing this? He says, uh, oh no, they're all sleeping. Four guys sleeping at 5.30 in the afternoon? I, I was just couldn't believe that. Mario Amaro died three months before his 30th birthday. The Mexican authorities refused to release his body until after their autopsy. Joe was forced to return to the United States without his brother. Within a week, the Mexican autopsy was complete. It listed the cause of death as loss of oxygen to the brain, the result of Mario hanging himself. Joe believed that was ridiculous and contacted his congressman. The Mexican autopsy confirmed the report of the jailers in Tijuana that Mario Amato had hung himself with his own sweater. This is the oldest excuse for a, a, a jail murder uh, uh, that's ever given is that the prisoner hung himself. As soon as Mario's body was returned to the United States, Joe hired a pathologist to do a second autopsy. This examination revealed internal injuries to Mario's liver, strong evidence that he had been punched in the upper abdomen. The report stated that with such injuries, quote, the victim would not likely have been able to hang himself. Mario Amato was most likely hung with an instrument, not his sweater, but some other instrument to use as the pretext for uh, the obvious ab abuse and finally the murder that took place. Ultimately, the Los Angeles County Coroner reviewed both the American and Mexican autopsy reports. He determined that Mario Amato had probably been murdered. There is another disturbing aspect to this case. Mexican authorities violated international agreements by not contacting the U.S. consulate as quickly as possible following Mario's death. You start to see uh, a picture of a cover-up starting to take place. The people involved in this incident uh, did not want authorities coming quickly to the scene of the crime. They wanted the period of time to elapse. They hoped that Joe Amato would forget about it. His brother was dead. He'd go back to the United States and, and drop the whole issue. I'd like to see the people that committed the crime suffer for it because we're suffering and somebody's got to suffer also. Somebody's got to pay, you know. Update. Congressman Berman wrote to the president of Mexico and eventually got the case opened. Mario's body was exhumed. This time, 
a new autopsy found enough evidence to call the death a murder. Soon after, a Mexican police officer was arrested, tried, and convicted of Mario's murder. However, this conviction was overturned four months later, and he was released. To date, there are no new suspects, and the case is still unsolved. If you have any information about the death of Mario Amato, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, the story of a missing girl who may have been abducted and forced into prostitution. Killeen, Texas. 21-year-old college student Elizabeth Campbell has a fight with her boyfriend, Ricky. Then she takes her books and storms out of his house. 45 minutes later, she calls Ricky from a payphone 11 miles away. Hello, oh, Ricky speaking. Hi, it's me, Elizabeth. Where are you? I'm at a store in Copper's Cove. How'd you get there? I got a ride. I'm a little scared. Just come pick me up. When Elizabeth called me from the convenience store and she wanted me to come pick her up, we got in kind of a little disagreement there because I was asking her why she left my house without telling me. That kind of frustrated me a little bit. I didn't understand really why she would do something like this, because it's not like her. Look, never mind. I'll call my parents. Don't worry about it. That night, Elizabeth Campbell disappeared. Her friends and family haven't seen her since. They hope that someone watching may have the missing clue that will help bring Elizabeth back home. Elizabeth lived a fairly sheltered life at home, but was planning to go to Texas A&M in the fall. As soon as we knew she was missing, we knew something had happened to her. It was too much out of character for her to not tell her mother where she was when she wasn't at home. Uh, excuse me, have either of you seen this girl around? Elizabeth's parents immediately passed out thousands of flyers through Central Texas. Their efforts soon paid off. Only six days after she was reported missing, a girl matching Elizabeth's description was spotted by a convenience store clerk about 85 miles from where she disappeared. This uh, car drove up to the fuel tanks, and a man got out of the car and took a young woman by the arm and brought her into the store with him, holding on to her arm. It wasn't as if it was a boyfriend-girlfriend type hole. Uh, uh, his hand was above her wrist. How are you there? How's Came everybody? up to the counter and pushed a $20 bill out with one hand off of a roll of money. And I said, is there anything else I could get you? And he just shook his head. The girl looked up at me, and I said, yes, could I help you? That's all. He said something to her in a language that I didn't understand. And she dropped her head, looked down, as if she was being punished or something, you know, for trying to say something. She just hit, put her face down. And that was the end of that. Her mother came into the store a couple weeks later asking could she put up this poster in the window about a missing girl. And it hit me just like that. I've seen that girl. And I said, that's the girl I saw with another man in the store a couple of weeks ago. And then another eyewitness came forward with a second sighting of the couple that matched the first in nearly every detail. The first thing that caught my eye was he had a real mean, rough look to him. He gave the attitude that he didn't want her to talk just to stay silent. And that's a weird situation because if someone wants to talk, they usually talk, but she didn't. When I handed the strawberry cone to him, Elizabeth Campbell looked up at me. You look very sad today. When I said, you look very sad today, she immediately dropped her eyes back down and wouldn't look back up at me. And vanilla for you? Elizabeth Campbell looked like she was being pulled around. She wasn't with him by choice. Despite these two sightings, 
local police were not convinced that Elizabeth was the young woman under the control of the rough-looking man. But two months later, another person claimed to have seen Elizabeth, this time at a gas station over 150 miles from Colleen. I just left my car going in to pay for the gas, uh, and I bumped into Elizabeth coming out of the store. Sorry, you okay? I'm sorry, excuse me. Elizabeth acted as if maybe she was frightened of someone or maybe she was being watched, and I felt like she was wanting to say more than, you know, excuse me. When I saw the photograph of Elizabeth, I automatically knew that that was the girl that I had bumped into in Garland. I was just positive that that was Elizabeth Campbell. Now they had three sightings. Elizabeth's parents were more and more convinced that their daughter was alive and being held against her will. We believe that she's being controlled by someone that uh, she's no longer able to think for herself or try to come home or call. Have either of you seen this girl around? The Campbells fear that Elizabeth has been abducted and is being forced to work as a prostitute. Usually when someone abducts another person for the purposes of prostitution, they, they have a whole process of where they strip away their identity and supply them with a new one. Oftentimes it involves being repetitively raped. They're deprived of food, they're deprived of light, they're deprived of water, of whatever it takes in order to strip away their identity and to, to force them to assume another one. The pimp creates an invisible leash by presenting himself as if he's omnipotent, as if everybody works for him. So no matter where you go, no matter what you're doing, I've got someone who works for me or a friend of mine watching you. That's why she would never make eye contact with anyone. She's not allowed to make eye contact with anyone. And if she does, and she looks like she's asking for help, then she goes back to the closet until she's learned. Excuse me. Have either of you seen this girl around? Elizabeth's parents refuse to give up hope. Well, there's no way we can give up until we find out where she is, what's happened to her. She's our daughter, not what somebody's tried to make her. She'll always be our little girl. This photo has been enhanced to show how Elizabeth might look today. She is five feet, two inches tall, and weighs about 97 pounds. She has brown hair, brown eyes, and occasionally wears glasses. Based on the two eyewitness descriptions of the man seen with the young woman, he appears to be five feet seven in height and weighs 160 pounds. He has acne scars on his face and seems to have plucked his eyebrows. If you have any information about the disappearance of Elizabeth Campbell, please visit our website at unsolved.com. Next, the story of a doctor who uses drugs to overpower his female victims and then rapes them. Bakersfield, California. Saturday night. Nice. I don't think I'm ever going to do Two women we'll call Patty and Stephanie are shooting pool at their favorite bar when they run into a friend of Stephanie's. Hi, Patty. Hi, nice to meet you. He introduces the women to his friend, Dr. Kenneth Frank. Stephanie and Patty agree to join them for a drink. Immediately I liked him. I thought, oh, he's a doctor, he's a nice guy. He was well dressed, well mannered. He's real friendly, just real talkative. What do you do? Um, I'm a dental assistant. Well, I'm, I'm studying to be a dental assistant. Oh, are you serious about it? Oh, yes. The conversation between Dr. Kenneth Frank and the woman we're calling Patty might seem like the beginning of a promising romance. However, Dr. Frank is a predator, and he's setting the stage for a vicious crime. Uh, I work with a couple of dentists. So. He said he had a friend, and he said that he might be hiring, and that he would give me a card, you know, referral and all that. Did that help you out? Yes, sure. Hey, no problem. I'd love to do it. Thanks. No 
Basically, he did act professional. Okay, well, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to go to the restroom. Okay. She's great. Yeah. And Stephanie. Uh, it's getting late. They decided to leave. They're not coming back? He said, I can give you a ride home. And I said, no, I'll wait. She didn't show up a few minutes later, and I was ready to go. And so I said, OK, well, do you want to still give me the ride home? And he said, sure. So we left in his car. And then he wanted to stop by his apartment to do something, he said. And I wanted him to get that job referral that he had told me about a dentist fan that was hiring. <laughs> By the time they got to Dr. Frank's apartment, Patty felt like she was getting a cold. Here we go. This will make you feel a lot better. Drink that. Kenneth Frank quickly mixed up a, quote, home remedy coffee drink that he claimed would get rid of Patty's cough. I drank it quickly, and it wasn't long after that my eyes started getting blurry. And then I was sitting there trying to figure out why my eyes were blurry. And then my ears started ringing, a real high pitch. And then I just, I fell over. I remember laying there, and I couldn't move. Patty, come on, Patty, time to wake up. After 36 hours, Patty finally woke up. She was totally disoriented. 7 o'clock, it's Monday morning, I've got to get to work. Come on, let's get going. I couldn't figure out what happened to Sunday. Somewhere I lost Sunday. You raped me. I didn't rape you. I knew that he had taken advantage of me, and I, I was so mad, I just felt like, you know, I wanted to hurt him like he hurt me. Patty was still groggy and confused, unaware that she had been drugged. Stuck here. without a car, she let the doctor drive her home. We turned the corner right by my apartments, and I lived in a really huge apartment complex, so I told him to let me out there. I didn't want him to see what apartment I lived in because I didn't want him to come after me. Patty, I wouldn't tell anybody about this if I were you. You do, like I'm gonna have to fix it so you can't. I started running, trying to get to my apartment. As I got to my apartment, which was in the very back, I saw him in his car. He was right in front of me, so he knew at that point where I lived. And I just started feeling nauseated, real, real bad. And I remember um, getting sick everywhere, and I couldn't, you know, I couldn't help it. It was kind of like the flu or something. Patty was still feeling the effects of Dr. Frank's home remedy and spent most of the day in a deep, drug-induced sleep. Like many victims of rape, she was overwhelmed by fear and embarrassment, and she did not immediately go to the police. Patty finally filed a report three months later, but she was worried that a trial would come down to her word against Dr. Kenneth Frank's an unknown student against an established me. physician. Patty also believed that it would jeopardize her future chances for employment. Are you willing to press charges? No. At the time, she stopped short of pressing charges. But if, if he does this again to somebody else, yes, I will. She did not have to wait long. Four months after he raped Patty, Dr. Kenneth Frank drugged and raped another woman, someone that he knew professionally. But this time, when she awoke 24 hours later, he admitted that he had drugged her. She immediately went for a blood test and found that the sedative in her system was eight times greater than what is normally given to a patient in surgery. She went directly to the police. Based on the statements of Patty and the other victim, Kenneth Frank was arrested, tried, and convicted of two counts of rape. But between the conviction and the sentencing, the judge made a bad decision. At that time, I requested that the judge take the defendant into custody. He was out on his own recognizance at the time. 
and the judge declined to do that. When he came up for sentencing 28 days, which is the normal period of time, um, he didn't show up. Dr. Kenneth Frank disappeared. For 17 years, he evaded capture. Update. While on the run, Kenneth Frank talked to his dad. His dad talked to a coworker, and the coworker called the FBI. Kenneth A. Frank was eventually captured near Tel Aviv, Israel, where he was married and practicing medicine under the name of Jonathan Efrat. He was brought back to California and sentenced to 12 years in prison. He served his time and has been released. Next, a woman tries to prove that she should inherit the fortune of auto baron John Dodge. All Sable Forks, New York. 16-year-old Carrie Lynn Nixon was walking home after making a trip to the store for her father. Somewhere between the store and her home, Carrie disappeared. My immediate reaction was terror, and it's been a nightmare ever since. Police had to wonder, was Carrie abducted, or had she simply run away? Carrie wrote some letters to a friend, and in these letters, she indicated she would like to live in Hawaii, live, move to Florida, possibly California, and in fact, leave the town of Osable Forks when she turned 18. My theory on this case is Carrie Lynn Nixon was abducted. Her father gave her $20 for groceries. She went to Thomas' store for her father, left Thomas' store with the bag of groceries. If she was a runaway, she would have done none of those things. She would have been dressed better. She would have taken money with her that she had in her bedroom after we searched her bedroom. She is a victim of a kidnapping. Authorities investigated dozens of reported sightings of Carrie but were unable to confirm even one of them. Nothing has been found, not one thing. She's walked off the face of the earth, as far as we're concerned. And then, two years later, there was a break in the case. Carrie's parents were watching this video, shot in Los Angeles, featuring the new kids on the block. Among the fans, Kathy and Gary Nixon saw a familiar face. We couldn't believe how much that this girl looked like our daughter. So we just kept rewinding it and going over and over and over, and we just couldn't believe it because we never really had any hope that she was alive. And then this, there's this girl that looks so much like her. I'm not 100% convinced, but it looks like our Carrie. Upon uh, viewing the tape, I picked the girl out immediately the first time it ran through. It was obvious to me that this girl did look like Carrie Nixon and appeared to be her. This detailed enhanced photograph was made from the videotape and compared with the picture of Carrie taken shortly before she disappeared. There's obviously many similarities. The hair length, the hair color, the shape of the face, the chin, the mouth, and it displayed a multiple of earrings in the right ear, in which Carrie Nixon has four earrings in her right ear and two on her left. So the uh, photo-enhanced finished product further convinced the Nixons that this could be their daughter. For Carrie's family, the image was a reason for optimism. They continued to hope that Carrie would one day come home. Update. While still in jail, a convicted bank robber named Robert Anthony Jones admitted to his wife that he had raped and murdered Carrie Nixon. At his wife's urging, Jones confessed to the police and led them to Carrie's body. Jones was convicted on multiple charges, including second degree murder. He received a sentence of 18 years to life. Carrie Nixon's parents have established a scholarship fund in her honor. Imagine that when your father dies, you learn that you were adopted. And then imagine that your biological father may have been one of the richest and most powerful men in the country. A man 
who is worth millions. Detroit, Michigan. Pat Mielbach and her daughters are visiting the estate that Pat might have grown up on if she had not been given up for adoption. It belongs to the descendants of John Dodge, founder of the Dodge Automobile Company. Pat never knew that John might be her father. Pat always believed that her father was Robert Manseer. But when he died, Pat read his will and was shocked to discover that she had been adopted. She immediately tried to uncover her adoption records, but the county court would only tell her that her father was unknown. The Michigan Adoption Agency gave her completely different information. They said that her parents were unmarried teenagers. If they'd have both matched, I'd have forgotten the whole thing. But when they have two different records on one person, there's something wrong. It's important to me for my children to know. And it's important that People are keeping it from me, and I don't see the reason for that. Years later, Pat's daughter was at a Christmas party and saw a biography on John Dodge. When she saw a picture of Dodge, she was amazed by the family resemblance. I could see my brother's face and my mother's radiating from the page, and it was as if I was in a time warp. Further research uncovered more likenesses between the families. Pat feels that her son, William, bears a striking resemblance to Horace Dodge Jr. And that her daughter, Sharon, could have been the twin of John Dodge's granddaughter, Frederica. I really got the chills when I saw John Dodge's face. I really did. And when we turned to the back of the book and I saw people's names that were friends of my father's, then, then I really thought this must be something to this. One name in the book was Frank Upton. According to Pat, Upton had been a frequent visitor at her home while she was growing up. Her father, Robert, called Upton, quote, the best of friends. And there was no denying Upton's connection to the Dodge family. Frank Upton also worked for John Dodge in a very personal capacity. He managed his business affairs. We suspect that he probably arranged the uh, adoption. Perhaps it is significant that around the time of Pat's adoption, the Manzers became wealthy. The loan on the Manzer home was paid off in cash. Mrs. Manzer began wearing mink, and Mr. Manzer began driving the first of many brand new Dodge cars. Longing for answers, Pat asked for a copy of her birth certificate. By accident, the state of Michigan sent her the birth certificate of Francis Dodge, who was born around the same time as Pat. The original birth certificate indicates that she was the first in order of birth of a quote-unquote other. So that certainly leads a reasonable person to conclude that she was the first to be born, and there was a second that was born immediately thereafter. There was a common rumor around the Dodge Brothers shop that, uh, that John F. Dodge had Siamese twins and that he kept one and gave one away. The Siamese twin theory was met with widespread disbelief. But Pat bears unusual scars on her head and neck that might be the result of a Siamese twin separation. As the controversy grew, a pediatric surgeon examined Pat's scars. The doctor's report said that it was unlikely that she was a Siamese twin, but the age of the scars made it impossible to determine their exact origin. With all the things that have come up, I'm sure I'm a Dodge. I'm not sure it'll ever be proven, but I'm sure I am just by what I know. I think it would only take five minutes for some judge or lawyers or whatever to look at the papers and just tell us one way or another. Pat filed a claim on the Dodge family fortune and asked the courts to open her adoption records. Both requests were initially denied. Years later, when Pat finally did get her birth certificate, it was severely damaged, and it had been clearly altered. Many sections had been erased and typed over. But Pat is still hopeful that someone somewhere will come forward with the answer. 
If you have any information that might shed some light on this case, please contact us at unsolved.com. Next, a young woman discovers a terrible secret and catches her parents in a lie that puts her in the center of an unsolved mystery. Somewhere in Texas, a little girl clutched her only friend and waited patiently. Her family was on the move again. Eventually, Monica LeBeau would move a total of 28 times in 15 years, nearly one move every six months. I would come home from school, you know, and there would be boxes everywhere, and I knew it was time to go again. Monica's parents, Pablo and Burma LeBeau, were relatively old. Monica's two half-sisters were already grown and had moved away. Monica had learned not to question her family's nomadic lifestyle or why she was always kept home from school on class picture days. I would get kind of angry because by the time I made friends, we were up and gone again, so um, that was kind of hard. And then at age 16, Monica came across a long buried family secret. My mother got ill, and I had to transfer my mother's medical papers to where she was in the hospital. And uh, I was reading through my mom's folder, and that's when I had found out that my mother had a total hysterectomy in 1945. There's no way I could have belonged to her. If Burma LeBeau wasn't Monica's mother, then who was? Answering that question has led Monica into a web of conflicting stories and outright lies. Worse still, they might cover up a shameful crime. Don't be concerned with this. It is not I asked my mother, I said, if you're not my mother, I want to know who is my mother. And um, she got mad, but um, she told me that my mother was a family member. My sister child she couldn't take care of you why didn't you tell me i was shocked and that was probably a, the worst shock of my life she said it was you um, it was but, true that monica's half sister was much older 19 years in fact but was she truly monica's mother i asked her straight out if she was my mother and uh, she said no i'm not your mother I don't believe her she said, well, mom just doesn't want to face the truth. And I said, well, what is the truth? And my sister told me that my real mother sold me for a bus ticket and that she was trash and no good, and I didn't need to know her anyway. Two conflicting and bizarre stories. Monica didn't know who to trust or what to believe. After searching her home, Monica finally found her birth certificate which indicated that she was born in Chicago during the early 1960s. But strangely, it listed no hospital, no address, and no doctor. And the document had been filed when Monica was seven years old, not at her birth. Years later, at age 26, Monica contacted an Illinois judge hoping to locate her adoption records. But the judge's response only deepened the mystery. Well, she told me that she could not find anything from the years 62, 63, 64, that she had searched all the records that they had there. For the next decade, Monica was haunted by the strange and conflicting stories about her past. Still, she managed to get on with her life, marry, and have a daughter of her own. Mom, I need to know who I am. And I think it's important for my daughter to know that too. During a rare family get together, Monica decided to try one last time to find out the truth. My mom at that point was just angry, very angry. She started getting mad and my sister, they just kind of looked at each other. <sighs> Mother! According to Monica, her half-sister suddenly became angry. 
birth to this child. She began ranting about how nearly four decades earlier, her mother had hidden a tiny baby from the police. I lies to the police, and I did that for oh, you and dad. She's lying now. Monica was stunned. In an instant, the past came flooding back. She remembered as a teenager overhearing her father talk about stashing a cardboard box in a bar, something about roadblocks and the need to tell the truth. A disturbing scenario had begun to emerge. The police were looking for The indication that I got from the whole thing is that my mother had probably kidnapped me. I really started thinking, my God, had they just up and take me, you know, from somebody. Wherever she turned, Monica was faced with a troubling past. Had she been abducted as an infant? A horrible crime that forced Pablo and Burma LeBeau to constantly run from the law. Or perhaps a desperate young girl had sold Monica for the price of a bus ticket. Or maybe the woman Monica knew as her half-sister was actually her own mother. I would be willing to go through anything, anything at all, to be able to find out the truth behind all this. I am without an identity, and uh, I am searching, and I'm probably going to keep searching. I'm not going to give up. Monica was born with a uniquely shaped earlobe on her left ear, a clue that may help confirm her true identity. And if she was, in fact, kidnapped, she believes it happened in the Miami, Florida area in 1963 or 1964. If you have any information on the whereabouts of Monica's birth parents, please log on to our website at unsolved.com.